nautical engineering and teaching students, and he was, you know, a professor. We would go at night, and we would have kerosene smoke. You actually had a mist of kerosene that you would flow over the foil, and then you would have the wind speed. He'd be able to control the wind speed, and he'd take it over, and he would judge, you know, whether it created turbulence or whether it had an even flow. What we used to talk about was laminar flow. Laminar flow, I can best explain that to you by taking a butter knife, or any knife, and hold it in the, the faucet as the water's coming out of the faucet. And if you turn it a little bit, all of a sudden you get all this turbulence. But if you have it just right, you create as little turbulence as possible. So those were the things that we were working with. That's the reason they tested keel designs. We were some of the first ones. Other people caught on. It took Charlie Morgan a while. <laughs> but Charlie was a real pioneer. I mean, he's the authentic thing. There's nothing, you know, he's a salesman, and you can say whatever you want about him. But the one thing I learned in my boat building experience was that uh, it takes a lot of people to build a boat. You know, and you got electricians, you got mechanics, you got fairers. I was fair, that was my deal, fairing boats. I enjoyed fairing them. I, I, I thought that was, uh, you know, something that I was interested in. It was, I used to wrestle in college and that was my physical fitness. You know, you get out there and sand hard. Now, fairing is where we would use, like, we would do all this stripping that we told you about as far as putting the frames up and all that, and then you would put the, the uh, wooden strips on the boat. But then we would put, like, balsa core. And balsa is a neat wood. It's real light. It's been around for years, you know, and uh, it, it comes in sheets where you get end grain balsa, what, what they call end grain balsa, and there's all sorts of varieties, but we got the cheapest is no reason to get anything more than the cheapest. And we would sand. And you'd sand and then you would fare. And you would use fillers that were um, basically um, easy to sand. Strong enough, but easy to sand. And we used at the time, like I said, we used uh, a lot of, of this, um, you know, Bondo. Because it was just easy. We made our own Bondo. We used Bondo, but th that was one of the fairing things. So we would sand, and when we would see a low spot after sanding, we would come back, we would etch that low spot, and we would fill over it, and then we'd start sanding some more. Now, the way you make uh, boards to sand, the longer the board, almost the better. I don't know if you've ever seen America's Cup boats, you know, but there, there they are with batten. In a board. And all of this stuff is what we used to call the secret of the pyramids. You know, how do they build a pyramid? You know, how do you build a boat? You know, a lot of work. And people sitting around trying to figure out how to do it better. So we all designed our own battens. You know, if you were really any good, you weren't going to use a batten somebody else would build, build your own batten. And then we go get floor sanding paper. I was always calling up the, <laughs> the floor sanding, you know, place to get these rolls of paper. And then you, you would take a board that was whatever, you know, maybe whatever um, width that you wanted it. Length, you know, if you were doing a large boat, you would use a large batten, like a six, eight foot batten. And then I had teams of people who were brought in to sand with me on a board. And then we had teams of boards, <laughs> you know, so like I was the sanding foreman at this company that was building these boats. And I really took it seriously. And believe me, a couple of people just would come up at the end of the day and say, this is not for me. But I noticed one thing is that these people were just answering ads that were put in the paper. That sometimes the guy that looked like he wasn't going to be any good at all would be great. And sometimes you'd have a guy who came in and looked like a weightlifter and he'd be rotten. A lot of it was attitude, and you know, whether somebody was trying to get in shape or whether somebody was just trying to ride the board. But after a while, when somebody's riding the board, you're going, hey, <laughs> you know. What's with it? How come you're not pushing it? How come I'm dragging you along? So we would sand these boats for weeks, months, you know what I mean? Sometimes, to get them just right. And then you'd finally come up with the perfect boat. And then I was fortunate enough to go and be um, captain of some of the boats. And, uh, and then I would take the boat and we'd take it off to the races. And of course you need owners. <laughs> They're just, you know, you have to have owners. I mean, they put the money up and everything, but uh, we would take these boats out and, and uh, 
like I said, because we had Ron Holland for a designer, uh, we won a couple of world championships. This boat won Canada's Cup. And I didn't have anything to do with the building of the boat. I helped build the rig. We built the rig in my backyard. And we built the mast and rig. And Lars Bergstrom was my brother-in-law, and he was, uh, he was into, among other things, not only keels, but masts. They got this theory that they came up with the ideal mass section. And how do you get the ideal mass section? Well, the mass that causes the least turbulence over the sail. So you just have a certain number of things you can control. If you can have this boundary layer of, of turbulence, reduce that, then you get more uh, useful sail area. And um, so anyway, that was Canada's Cup. This was the World Championship. This boat won, you know, like uh, several national things, uh, races. Uh, let's see what these are. This is just some of the boats we sailed on, local PHRF. Um, this boat, best boat I ever helped build. And what happens is a lot of people, they take the credit for what other people do. You know what I mean? Like Ron Holland goes and beats his chest and he's the greatest. He's the greatest designer. I never saw him picked up a, a sanding board or fair anything. The only thing I can tell you and what I've agreed with with most people is you don't win the world championship with an unfair boat. You know what I mean? So the fairing was good. I had done my job. I never even sailed on a boat. So I was captain of another Ron Holland boat, but this imp was too special a boat. The owner came in. He came in with his own crew. The guy who helped me loft this boat, um, his name was Hoken Sodergren. He was Swedish, and we both knew the same words for the same things. So it worked out pretty good. And then the designer was like a hippie kind of guy. We were all, my girlfriend was looking at a movie I had of us building boats, and she said, well, you're a bunch of hippies. And I said, yeah, we're a bunch of hippies in the field. You know, that's what we were outstanding in our field. We were, you know, basically, we moved from Nelson Paving uh, when we needed bigger accommodations, we went to a casket factory in Plant City. You know, Plant City is uh, sort of out in the country. And we built these boats there. And uh, this one was called M World Ocean Racing Champion. The only World Ocean Racing Champion to come out of Florida, ever. Was she 38 feet? She was actually 43 feet, 43. and she was what they called a one and three quarter tenner, oh, yeah. and she had an unusual little thing in that she looked simple. I mean, you look at her, she was like Ron Holland's designs, all of them. Deceivingly simple looking, but they were winners. They had a nice shape. When we had this, we were building two, we were building a two tonner and a one and three quarter tonner at the same time. So we were working on both of them. I'm not telling you about the boats that didn't do good. <laughs> you know? But one was called Jackknife, and one was called Imp. And both owners came with the best intentions. They wanted the fastest boat in the world. Ron Holland was the hot designer, you know? We were the builders. So we built Jackknife and we built Imp. You go by one, one looks like a guppy, and the other looks like a mackerel. I mean, you know, you just look at them on the floor and say, Ron. <laughs> you know, what's going on? This one's so much different from the other one. But this was a breakthrough boat. This revolutionized boat design. This was a boat that was like a watershed. People saw this boat and they said, hey, wow. What year was that? I'm going to say 1976, you know, the same yeah. year I came back to New College and asked to be admitted. <laughs> you know, if I could please, you know, come back. And so anyway, uh, this boat, um, they shipped it all over the world. They won everything in America. They shipped it over to England. They won Fastnet, won everything, you know, that they could over there. Shipped it down. Finally, I don't know what other places they went, but they had to ship it down to um, Australia. And they it wasn't went down in the 79 there. Fastnet, was it? Uh -uh, no, 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 no. This is before that. But anyway, so this is a great, famous boat. Ron Holland is, like I said, right now, he's one of the top designers in the world. Um, you know, all I can tell you is that my interest and, and what I can add to the program here is, uh, is ocean racing. 
to me, that's all it ever was, was ocean racing. I won a couple of dinghy races. I got a, um, a laser. <coughs> Bruce Kirby was my friend. <laughs> you know? So Bruce Kirby says, hey, I got this new boat. I think you ought to try it out. And I thought, well, cool. And it was number 650, and it cost me 650. 650 bucks for number 650. I don't know how many they've built now, but it's, it's they've built like oh, hundreds. 15,000 by now. 15,000, to try 100 and something thousand. I mean, they're, they're up there. They're even uh, challenging that, you know, they're, a lot of them have been built. So I had number 650. More, more, than a, more than a sunfish? I think they're right in there. They may be yeah. more than the sunfish, but they're close. But they're, they were up there. But anyway, I bought that boat. I won a championship here out of 50 boats. I think I also won the, uh, you know, 24-foot boats. Now I look back at them, I think of them as dinghies. You know what I mean? You know, they're little teeny boats. We won the uh, J24 championship. You know, we had a J24. Uh, we brought in a special sailors. You know, we just would kind of go around and have connections, and we bring people in for the races. And uh, Joe Byers, who was a guy I sailed with for years, he was really cool, uh, up in Tampa. And he had a J24. Mark Plo, Chris Cadley, Tom Mayers, and Joe Byers. And we won the, uh, the J24 Southeastern Championship. So, you know, basically, I'm trying to get people encouraged here to, to get ocean racing. What we're trying to do is get boat donations brought in. Uh, the only way to get boat donations is to, to bring in people who are interested in donating. And uh, we, we need to, to work on that. Right now, we have one boat that was donated that's a... a boat that actually that was the boat Dove. If you've ever heard of a boat Dove, have you heard that? The boat out there that was donated was the one that was sailed around the world, the first single-handed. So I mean there's all kinds Robin, of... Robin Lee Grimm did that back in yeah. And you just need people who are interested in what they're doing. If you can get interested in it, we'll try to provide you with boats. But we, we realize after our years... Al and I have been talking about this since we first met at New College. He was the new guy, the new kid on the block. I'd already been here for 10 years. When did you come you in? You had 10 years as a student, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I took the longest to graduate of any student. Except Rick Dolan. No, no, I beat him. You did? Yeah, he was 18 years. I took 20 years. Oh, okay, yeah. Your, your hand's down the winter. Yeah, so anyway, my mother, would, God bless her soul, when she found out she had cancer and she was dying, she said, here's $10,000, will you please go back and get your degree? So by this time, I dropped out again, you know. And I went in to, to Nancy Ferraro, <laughs> you know, and there I am, and I certainly didn't burn any bridges. I was as nice as I could be because I was, uh, you know, trying to, to beg for admissions. And so uh, Nancy said, well, what's your area of concentration? I said, I think the length of concentration is my problem. <laughs> you know, I'll pick an area. Don't worry about that. So I was finally admitted back to New College with the money that my mother gave me. And I did finish with John Morrill, who was the guy who, uh, the only class I ever unsatted, you know, what unsatting class is. The only one I unsatted was with John Morrill. And I said, you know, John will give me a break. I, you know, as a tutorial on barrier islands. I live on a barrier island, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I didn't write a paper that he wanted or didn't do something he wanted and he was being a hard ass, which teachers can be. I mean, I, I can understand that. And he unsatted me. I lost, like, years. I came back, when I came back, they said, uh, well, you know, we're going to take away that because, uh, you know, you've been away for more than five years and we're taking away, I think it was two years of New College, back to my junior college, before I even started back at New College again. And I told Nancy, I said, well, only you know what a New College education is worth. <laughs> you can take it away from me, take it away. So I had to go back and do it the hard way. I had to start all over again, throw away a year and a half. And then I did, and I graduated with John Morrill, the one who unsat at me, talking about the hard way. And, uh, and I got my degree, and I wrote my thesis on... Uh,